Welcome from the American Planning Association's International Division and from AARP to the World Town Planning Day session, Planning Livable Communities for All Ages. My name is Stephanie Firestone. I am a Senior Strategic Policy Advisor with AARP and uh, an Urban and Environmental Planner by training. Briefly, I'm going to provide a substantive frame for our conversation around livable communities for all ages. I'll then pass the baton to uh, Sean Jones, who is an Urbanization Policy Officer with HelpAge International, and he'll discuss how the twin trends of longevity and urbanism are being addressed in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Then Dr. Mildred Warner, Professor from the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell University, will present survey findings around planning for multi-generational communities. Dr. Laura Keyes, lecturer at the Department of Public Administration with the University of North Texas, will present survey findings from an educational intervention on cross-sector collaboration in planning livable communities for all ages. And then myself and Michael Amabile, a senior planner with ARUP, an international design, planning, and engineering firm, will talk about continuing opportunities for planners around the world to engage in, to contribute to, and to learn from this deepening conversation. This is a visual of the aging population in the United States. So this is 65 plus in the year 2010. And what you can see on the screen is the darker the blue, the older the state is. This is the 65 plus population in the year 2020. And I do wanna point out that the 80 plus population growth rate in the United States is two times the speed of the 65 plus and almost four times that of the total population. This aging of populations due to lower birth rates and, and more so increasing lifespans is a global phenomenon. Today, Japan is the only country in the world where 60 plus represents 30% or more of the population, but by 2050, it's projected that 62 countries will reach that milestone. This graph from AARP's Aging Readiness and Competitiveness Report released in 2017 examined 12 countries that together represent nearly half of the people age 65 plus around the world. The UN and the World Health Organization use the definitions in this graph to describe the share of people age 65 or older in a society. So if it's more than 7%, it's called an aging society greater than 14% an aged society, and greater than 21% a super-aged society. It took the U.S. 70 years to transition from aging to aged, 45 years for the U.K., 40 years for Germany, and 25 years for Japan. And Brazil and China are projected to complete this transition in about 20 years and then join the super-aged society in just 10 to 15 years later. And older adults today have different perspectives on how and where they want to live. One of the most consistent features of older adults around the world is their strong preference to age in their home or community for as long as possible. Independent living is on the rise, particularly in developing countries where families are shifting away from multi-generational structures. So the nation cities and towns, suburbs and rural areas, all need to be preparing for this aging population now. There are some universal challenges to this idea of aging in the community. Homes, for example, that were built for the younger, more able-bodied often don't accommodate aging. In fact, in the United States, two-thirds of those 85 plus today have at least one disability. There are unsafe streets, older adult pedestrian fatalities are actually disproportionate to their percentage of the population and falls account for 68% of seniors' hospitalizations. Approximately half of those falls take place outside of the home. There's a lack of transportation options. People live on average a decade after they reach their driving retirement or have to give up the keys. And people are isolated. In fact, in the US, the number of people 75 plus living alone is expected to double from 2015 to 2035. So all communities need to make the built environment, housing, transportation, and other services appropriate and accessible for people 
across an increasingly long lifespan. But there are also opportunities from increased longevity, and it's imperative that we rethink the role of older adults in our communities and our economies. They're not only living longer, but they're living healthier. In many countries, they're wealthier than generations before them. In the United States, 83% of U.S. household wealth is held by people over 50. They possess valuable experience and expertise, and they increasingly seek to remain active and productive. In the United States, 50 plus are one of the fastest growing groups of entrepreneurs. In fact, they're twice as likely as millennials to start a business. And finally, we need to ensure that older adults are able to remain not only independent, but also active and contributing members of their community. One of the most important ways that older adults contribute is through volunteering. It's a huge renewable resource for social problem solving. This slide from Johns Hopkins University's Center for Civil Society Studies took a tool that was developed by the International Labor Organization to measure volunteer work. And they took data that was gathered in the early 2000s from 36 countries to estimate that if all the world's volunteers in a typical year gathered in one uninhabited territory, which they entitled Volunteer Nation, that's the red bar, the work of these volunteers, even conservatively valued, would make this territory the seventh largest economy on the globe. In 2005, the estimated economic value of the entire world's volunteer workforce was 1.35 trillion U.S. dollars. And there's definitive evidence that people who volunteer live longer, are happier, physically healthier, and less depressed, which also saves the community resources on the back end. And these causative effects of volunteering seem to be stronger for older adults than for younger people, in part perhaps because volunteering often replaces lost roles as wage earners and parents, providing a new sense of purpose, social networks, and self-esteem. Perhaps the most significant step toward taking advantage of these opportunities and overcoming these challenges is the WHO's creation in 2010 of the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities. Developed as a model that includes eight age-friendly city domains, those are pictured in the flower, and it created tools and guidance for local communities to undertake this work. In 2012, AARP began to recruit and support communities in the United States to become age-friendly as an affiliate of this global network. And the tools created by the WHO and AARP are also being used by many more thousands of communities that are not necessarily a part of these formal networks, but are nonetheless working with multiple stakeholders at the local level to make their communities livable for all ages. And I want to emphasize that given the element of rapidly increasing longevity discussed earlier, most of them also focus on the shift from older adults being a small segment of communities' population to older adults being a large percentage of the population. And this significant expansion of lifespans is a relatively new challenge that planners must address. A planner's role envisioning the form and future growth of community means that they need to address functional abilities that relate to the environment, or what we call social determinants of health. That's home, community, social life, work, and other structures that a person interacts with. And I also want to note the importance of including all people of all ages. Uh, that includes immigrants and low-income residents and other marginalized people in the community so that all community residents can age successfully. I'll close with a nod to the twin trend of longevity, which is urbanization. So with that, I want to pass the baton on to Sean, who will discuss how this is being addressed by the international community via the Sustainable Development Goals. Sean? Thank you, uh, Stephanie, and thank you uh, again for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. I'm the Urbanization Policy Officer for Help Age International. So I'm going to take the opportunity to familiarize everyone involved in urban planning with the international frameworks that exist around development, particularly looking at low and middle income countries and with relevance to aging populations and older people. 
after briefly introducing HelpAge and the work that we do, I'm going to look at some data around aging and urbanization. And then I'm going to summarize the sustainable development goals, the new urban agenda, and a quick look at our own aging in the city report. And look at what they each say about aging and urbanization. So HelpAge International is a global network of civil society organizations working to protect and rights of older people, particularly in low middle income countries. We have 127 member organizations across 77 countries and our strategy aims to ensure that in our old age we all enjoy a secure income, the best possible health, that we are safe and secure and free from violence and abuse and that our voice is heard. So listed on the slide are some examples of our work and you can obviously learn more about us by going to our website. So I think most people assume that older people tend to prefer to retire away from the city. They like to go to the countryside. But the data actually shows that 58% of older people globally live in cities. This is actually higher than any other age group. So an older person is actually more likely to live in a city than a, than a younger person. Older people are also the fastest growing cohort of urban populations. And there are over 500 million older people already living in cities. This is not a small number. Added to that, the 70% of older people globally live in low and middle income countries, which are rapidly aging. You can see that the issue of aging and urbanization is, is, is global, but particularly in, in the global south. In Latin America, older people living in cities make up the equivalent population of Sao Paulo, Mexico City, and Bogota combined. It's the same story even in Africa, where the narrative tends to focus on young populations and urbanization. Asia is home to a massive 250 million older people already living in cities, and all these numbers are going up. But what this data doesn't show us is the inequality that we experience, both because we live in cities and as we grow older. A huge number of older people living in cities live in poverty and have very different levels of access to the services that are generally seen as the supposed benefits of living in a city. So how do internationally agreed frameworks and agreements respond to aging urban Well, the Sustainable Development Goals are the follow-up to the Millennium Development Goals. They're universal, meaning they're commitments made by every country that's a member of the UN, whether they're rich or poor, and they aim to address a wide range of issues over the next 15 years. Most relevant to urbanization and planning is Goal 11, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Now, each goal has targets and indicators, and Goal 11 talks about the importance of safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable public transport, with special attention to the needs of different people, including older persons. It also focuses on the value of safe, inclusive, and accessible green and public spaces. But of course, we can't take these goals and targets as gospel. They have many gaps and deficiencies. For example, the target for green and public space specifies the amount of green space, but not its quality or its safety. These are key characteristics if we want to make sure that older people and the rest of the community are actually using the spaces that are available to them. The city goal, goal 11, of course, is not the only goal relevant to urban planning. Goal 3 on health, 6 on water and sanitation, and goal 13 on climate change are also particularly relevant. As I've already mentioned, however, significant gaps remain. And so whilst the Sustainable Development Goals provide an initial global framework, our response to aging urban populations needs to be, needs to be broader than what's prescribed in these, in these limited set of goals. So enter the new urban agenda. So agreed by UN member states at the Habitat 3 conference in October 2016, it's held every 20 years and it aims to agree a shared direction for urban development over the next two decades. I'm actually also the co-chair of a coalition of organizations that work on issues of aging and urbanization that specifically advocated for the inclusion of older people in the new urban agenda. The document ended up with 27 references to aging and older people, uh, whereas the initial draft only had three. So these 27 references cover diverse areas such as housing, public space, and public transportation. But it also covers key principles relevant to aging in, in urban contexts, including the need to challenge discrimination based on age and any other characteristic. It also mentions the, the importance of the participation of older people in local government, in planning, and investment decisions. Also included was the need to have age disaggregated data collection so that policy and decision makers have the information that they need to make decisions that are appropriate to the populations that they are trying to address. 
So the new urban agenda has a mix of physical and social kind of political recommendations to improve the experience of older age in urban centres. But of course it's still an uphill struggle in cities that are largely dominated by private vehicles, air pollution, crime and private interest and profit. So these frameworks, they give us a guiding direction. I think we also need to bear in mind that in a lot of lower middle income contexts that we work in, that the capacity of the local level, at the municipal level, is often lacking. And so there's big challenges ahead to be able to implement these recommendations. So lastly, I'll just mention briefly, in the run-up to the Habitat 3 conference, Help Aging in the City, uh, which you can download from our website, it discusses three key issues. And the report was based on focus groups and community level engagement that we carried out in Mexico City, in Rio de Janeiro, in Beirut, and also in Delhi. So we we're trying to bring the voice of all the people, reflecting that point that participation is actually really important in order to understand properly the challenges that are, that are happening. So it discusses three key issues. Firstly, the need to reclaim urban spaces for all people and create pleasant and welcoming, walkable environments that encourage us to interact and participate in society. We feel that it's not enough to just have spaces that are physically accessible, although that's a precondition. The spaces actually need to be places that people want to spend time in. One of the highest, one of the biggest issues that we have as we grow old is the risk of social isolation. And so wanting and being encouraged to go out and interact with the community is, is a key issue. The report also talks about the burden of air pollution and also non-communicable disease such as diabetes, the rate of which is much higher in urban centres due to sedentary lifestyles and poor diets. And of course the impact of these diseases is greatest as we age. The report also looks at urban safety and security in older age, recognising that crime is a big issue that old people specifically identified as a key barrier to their participation in city life and also humanitarian emergencies which are increasingly happening in urban contexts across the world. So that's just a brief summary of what's happening at the international level in terms of guidance around ageing and urbanisation and fitting in with other development objectives more broadly. You're welcome to get in touch with me directly if you have any questions or you're interested in our work. Uh, thank you for listening and I think now I'm passing on to Mildred. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I'm Mildred Warner, I'm a professor in the department planning at Cornell University and I want to talk about a multi-generational approach to creating livable communities. So how do we build more age-friendly communities? Well I'm going to argue that we need a broader approach. We should not just focus on aging, we should focus on all ages, children, caregivers, elders. While we give lots of attention to physical issues, we also need to pay attention to the social layer. And physical design is important, but we also need to think about maintenance and norms of use because they can obliterate good design or they can ameliorate bad design. And it's not just the role of planning, which is our focus here today, but also the importance of participation and building institutional partnerships, which Laura will get into in more detail in the next presentation. And finally, we have traditionally planned for men. And as we think about planning for aging, it also opens the, broadens our lens to think about the need to plan for women and children. So for evidence, I'm going to show uh, some results from some U.S. national surveys that we did with the American Planning Association, with AARP, and with the International City County Management Association. And then I'm also going to present some work that uh, some of my students did when we were in Rome this past spring. So an all-age approach. While the World Health Organization has an age city initiative, this initiative is primarily focused toward the older years of life. UNICEF has a child-friendly cities initiative that's focused toward the younger years. And what you'll notice with both of these frameworks is that they have many common elements. The ones I've highlighted here in blue tend to deal more with physical aspects of the environment and the ones in green focus more on the social aspects of the environment, both being extremely important. So when we think about not just physical but physical and social, I want to give you an example of an unplanned neighborhood on the outskirts of Rome, Pineta Sacchetti, where there are almost no sidewalks. If you look at the map, only the green lines of roads have sidewalks, the red and yellow do not. And this is an area that's pretty hilly, but what's happened is the norms of use in this neighborhood slow the flow 
and this reduces conflict between users. And so in effect, these streets become complete streets, but the, despite poor design. So cars, pedestrians share these streets together. It's also not just about design, but we also need maintenance and good norms. So here's another neighborhood, a richer neighborhood closer to the center of Rome, Italy, called Piazza Alessandria. And you'll notice a well-defined crosswalk with a, a median to wait in the middle of a very wide road. You can see on the other side there's a bike trail. Um, but then you see in the picture below a car parked in the middle of the crosswalk. This is quite common throughout Rome. And so good design can be undermined by poor maintenance and violating uses. So when we think about reaching beyond planning, we need to think about participation and building new institutional partnerships. In, in our work in Pineta Sacchetti and Tufello, two uh, lower income peripheral neighborhoods of Rome, we found that the library was an excellent resource to reach out to the community, as well as senior centers and schools. And we were able to engage both youth and older adults through photo voice exercises, mapping, surveys, and focus groups to hear their needs and interest. We also need to move beyond a focus on men and also think about women and children. Now when we think about women, we recognize that women face a triple burden. They have household responsibilities for child care and elder care, and these responsibilities fall more heavily on women in every country in the world. They're also involved in the labor force, both the formal labor force and the informal labor force. And oftentimes we as planners focus more on the formal and forget the informal. This is a problem. Third, women face spatial constraints of separation of home and work, which um, eats up their time and makes it more difficult to negotiate in the urban environment. And as you age, we all become a little bit more like women. We have more concerns with care, we have more involvement in informal labor force activities, and the spatial constraints become more of a burden. So I'm arguing that we need a multi-generational planning approach. Inclusive design, designing our cities not just for our aging population, but also keeping an eye toward the young and the caregivers in the middle. Looking for possibilities of shared services rather than segregating services and neighborhoods by age, thinking of possibilities for integration and sharing across age, and in hopes that this will lead us to a common vision um, for all residents of the community. So where is current practice in the U.S.? I'm going to briefly talk about a few surveys that we've done. Back in 2008, we did a survey with the American Planning Association on family-friendly planning. Then in 2010, AARP, ICMA, and the National Area Agencies on Aging did a survey on maturing of America, which looked at services for elders. In 2013, we did a survey on planning across generations with the International City County Management Association. And in 2014, we did a survey with the Planning um, and Women Division of the APA on women and aging. Common themes that emerged in all of these survey results were that planning codes and zoning matters and that participation is key. Let's look at the family friendly planning survey. So we were interested, we had a set of about 35 actions that planners could do, that's the green box, um, to create a city that's more friendly for children and young families. And the main drivers that differentiated communities that did more action from those that did not was if they had families participating in their planning processes. The other thing that was important was site planning and zoning, the nitty gritty detail. Notice that comprehensive planning did not lead to more action. In fact, it led to resistance. Stating goals, putting it out front, led to NIMBY, not in my backyard, type responses. While positive attitudes reduced active resistance, ignorance was the major driver of resistance. So it suggests that we have an educational process that we need to move forward on, and we should really give our attention to family participation and site planning and zoning as the way to move forward. So do we include the needs of children and seniors in our plans? This was a question we asked, 
in 2013 of 1,500 city managers across the U.S. And guess what? Almost half of our communities do not include any language about seniors or children and youth in their comprehensive plans. We're a little better on emergency plans. Um, with disasters, we recognize that seniors and children and youth can be the most vulnerable in the context of a disaster. So we're now seeing almost two-thirds of our plans addressing their needs. And in economic development, we're less than a third. So we have quite a distance to go. So what leads to change? Again, in this survey, the results showed something similar to what we had seen with the family-friendly planning survey. Participation, that's what drives the chain. Participation of elders and families with children. We also need community leadership, elected officials, developers, the planning and zoning board. This is what helps lead us to have comprehensive plans that address the needs of aging and children in their language. When you have those plans, you're more likely to have zoning codes that will lead you to a better built environment, broader housing choices, and more services for children and elders. So I'll show you some quick results from the 2013 National Survey. And if we think about outcomes, an environment that's conducive for aging in place and also conducive for growing up well, you can think about neighborhood schools or sidewalk systems connecting your neighborhood or a playground within a half mile, access to food markets, public gathering spaces, mixed use, complete streets. What you'll see with all of these is that there's a metro core suburban rural gradient. Metro core areas are more likely to have these um, age friendly features. What you'll also notice is that the majority of communities do not have these features in the majority of their community area. So even when communities do say they have this feature, we're only finding, for example, 70% of metro core areas saying that they have more than half of their community has access to a neighborhood school. That means the other half does not. So zoning regulations can lead us in the right direction. If you've got any development pressure, your new development could at least follow some of these more age-friendly guidelines, like mandating a sidewalk system or promoting parks and recreation facilities in all neighborhoods or building street connections, uh, pedestrian-friendly design guidelines. And again, here you see the metro suburban rural gradient. And in rural areas, for example, pedestrian-free design guidelines are found in less than 20% of communities. We had talked about the importance of linking the informal and the formal and paying attention to care work. I want to draw your attention to the, the next one on allowing child care centers. Less than half communities allow child care centers in their zoning regulations. And how about child care businesses in residential units by right? This could be either formal or informal, family-based child care. Again, less than half of communities allow this. So this, is, this speaks to the separation of spheres, the public and private sphere, and the ignoring of the importance of care work in planning. When we think about housing, we have less than 20% of respondents saying that their communities allow accessory dwelling units. So we need cross-agency partnerships to move forward. And so we asked if any of the following agencies were involved in cross-agency partnerships at the community level to serve children and seniors. And right up there at the top, just like we found in Rome, libraries and school districts. They're really engaged and reaching out to serve the needs of children and seniors. And down at the bottom is the transportation or highway department, the least likely to collaborate with anybody. And that's where most of the planning money in the U.S. is found. The planning department is just a little bit further up. Your economic development and housing agencies aren't much better, except in urban areas the housing agencies look better. So we have a need for more cross-agency partnerships, but we're not there yet. So this is referring to the uh, survey that we did on women and aging. And what we can see is that an emphasis on aging helps to drive us toward more gender sensitive land use actions um, in terms of paying attention to spatial constraints, to the role of informal and informal work, to the importance of care work, 
So we can think of aging, our aging societies, as an opportunity to move us forward to a planning that is more sensitive to the needs of everyone. If you're interested in any of uh, more information on these surveys, you can find all of this at my website, MildredWarner.org. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Keyes. Thank you so much, uh, Mildred. And I think that this uh, session will help um, demonstrate how to continue the educational interventions that you referenced as being necessary um, as we continue to figure out opportunities to advance livable communities for all ages. So uh, in March of 2017, aging, the American Planning Association and AARP came together to help sponsor a summit to bring together um, different professions to discuss the status of livable communities for all ages and to find opportunities to foster collaboration between these professions. The goals of the summit were really to help these professions engage with each other and learn about planning and aging relative to each other's work, to investigate areas of overlap, and to discuss opportunities for coordination. The focus of the summit was to provide LCA planning tools to multiple professions in one setting. Uh, in this ex experience, we provided academic research, the latest in area plans, from area agencies on aging and the latest in AARP planning tools, including their livability index and their future of housing toolkit. We had panelists present on various different planning interventions related to creating communities for all ages. Uh, these were initiated both from the side of AARP's Age Friendly Cities initiatives as well as um, through the leadership of regional planning councils. We also uh, let participants participate in a facilitated deep dive of certain issues important to LCA planning work, including healthy foods, safe and accessible housing, health services, and opportunities for social interaction. This was a purposeful event that was scheduled um, to follow the American Society on Aging's National Conference. So it's not a surprise that 45% of the participants represented the aging sector. But through effective recruitment strategies, we were able to secure participation with over 25% um, of representation by planners. Over 61% of all of our attendees, which was a total of 250 participants, indicated some work initiated in the area of livable communities for all ages planning. The most success occurring relative to activities of engagement. As you can see, um, those activities included hosting visionary meetings and also creating citizen steering advisory committees for their community. Our research interest was understanding the factors such as trust, reputation, and reciprocity that may influence cross-sector collaboration between the planning and aging professions. Our research interest is in understanding the factors such as trust, reputa reputation, and reciprocity that influence cross-sector collaboration between planning and the aging professionals. Planning provides the opportunity to facilitate community change through zoning. Aging provides the opportunity to identify direct services needed by older adults. The Livable Communities for All Ages framework provides the opportunity to facilitate these relationships. The event itself served as the platform for our data collection. We utilized three survey instruments, including a pre-event survey, an event evaluation survey, as well as a post-event six-month follow-up survey. Four strategic lessons learned emerge helping leaders seeking to serve change in their communities. Our first lesson was the relationship with the planner is within reach. We tend to associate the initiation of LCA work with the aging sector, but findings from our survey instruments illustrate an important connection is growing with the planning sector. Over 11% of aging professionals 
indicated an area of planning as a primary focus of their current work efforts. Planners are also beginning to identify with aging policy. These findings provide evidence, while reasonably limited, of a connection between the aging and planning fields. 14% of respondents also indicated that their city or regional planning agency was a lead for their livable communities for all ages work. The LCA summit also demonstrated some level of effectiveness as a learning intervention as there was a significant difference of participant recognition of the value of cross-sector collaboration and relationships relative to LCA work before and after the event. This is not surprising as the eight WHO domains for age-friendly cities are relevant to many different professions. Identifying points of commonality are important for goal alignment and collaboration. Participants were asked to identify the most important livable for community all ages characteristics important to their work. These characteristics included mobility, housing, the built environment, programs and services, access to information, public security, civic participation, volunteerism, leadership, and access to health. A correlation analysis between the profession type and these characteristics revealed that access to health was common for both planners and aging professionals in the context of this summit. This is not surprising, given many were there as part of the larger American Society on Aging Conference. These findings do raise the point that access to health could serve as the vehicle or starting point to identify goals between these groups. Communities may find it productive to survey professions of interest to identify areas of overlap and points of commonality. Having a previous relationship and working together on community projects influences trust and reduces uncertainty and risk. The most prominent group identified as most actively working with LCA were area agencies on aging, followed by the group Other identify groups including citizen-led councils and nonprofits. Actually, respondents indicated strong relationships with other partner professions, including planning, health, and the aging sector. The most important reason for fostering this relationship is due to the other organization's recognizable lead role on these issues. We find that trust, reputation, and reciprocity are important components of collaboration. In fact, 83% attributed their current success in the LCA planning arena based on a previous experience of working together with the other field. Over 50% suggest their lack of success in advancing LCA work was related to the lack of municipal leadership and a lack of a culture of collaboration in that municipality. In fact, AARP's Age-Friendly Communities initiative requires a letter of commitment from municipal leadership, recognizing the importance of leadership from the top to ensuring successful outcomes of these efforts. A solid foundation for collaboration exists, as both professions rely on similar tools to ad advance their planning, including visioning with residents and the public, establishing steering committees, and performing needs assessments to a collect valuable community data. Needs assessments and knowing demographics were identified as two crucial tools in advancing livable for communities all ages work. These are standard engagement and data collection processes that could be leveraged to engage planners and the aging sector. So when examining catalysts for the aging sector to engage planners in livable communities for all ages work, it was noted by participants that there were three opportunities that seemed most beneficial, including the opportunity to leverage a project or program currently underway, to take advantage of an open policy window, or to leverage a new funding opportunity that may exist in their local budget. Certain catalysts for engaging planners to participate in LCA efforts were also mentioned, including hosting participatory meetings with planners and community residents on livable communities for all ages, 
participating in a locally derived age-friendly community initiative, and again, providing written information on changing demographic and aging issues. Working together will help both professions navigate policy changes that benefit older adults while paying attention to their needs and wants. So with that, I'm going to pass this back to Stephanie Firestone to help us understand where we go from here. Great, thank you, Laura. So in our final few minutes, we want to share some of the ways that we are continuing this conversation and more importantly, ways that we need your input to inform this conversation. So at the top of the box, uh, we listed some of the next steps. Uh, the uh, survey information that Laura just presented will be written up in an article in the International Journal Working with Older People. They're doing a special edition on age-friendly communities that should be out in January 2018. Uh, and then there is a second Livable Communities for All Ages Summit at the American Society on Aging's annual conference in San Francisco in March. Um, and we're hoping to do a session at the International Federation on Aging's 14th Global Conference on Healthy Aging as well. That's in Toronto in August. Uh, but most importantly, and the most important next step is that we need you for this. Uh, so essentially, we're currently conducting an initial phase of research among planners around the world on what motivates planners to engage in this agenda of infusing aging considerations into their regular planning work. In other words, how to get planners to play. And we're asking that you please take, it would only take you five to 10 minutes to complete the survey which you can link to now or you can participate at any time until around the beginning of December. You can get to the survey through either the AERP or APA websites with a backslash uh, planner engagement survey, one word. And we really, really encourage you to help and share your knowledge with other planners. We're also hoping to conduct a facilitated discussion around what we learned through this research at APA's 2018 National Policy Conference in New Orleans in April. And we're starting to collect best practices as a part of this research as well. So I'm just going to pass it on to my colleague, Michael, who will share some additional information. Thanks, Stephanie. So as Stephanie said, we really need your help to help further the, the understanding and knowledge base around living uh, livable communities for all ages. And so in addition to the survey, we're working to gather best practices from around the globe to help inform and inspire planners as to how they can how we can support their efforts uh, to do more in this area. So we're really looking for some good best practices um, that um, will hopefully come about through the survey respondents, um, as well as through other pr practitioners and planners. Um, the survey. At the end of the survey, there'll be a link to a, uh, a form where people can fill out um, some very simple questions um, that will help us understand some best practices. So essentially, the last question in the survey is, do you know of a best practice that you'd like to have highlighted um, as part of this research? And then you'll uh, be able to click through to that and submit um, the information on the best practice. So, it's very simple. We're really looking for just some, some basic bullets that members of the research team will follow up on, but things like the type of work, the setting, the area of practice, so housing or transportation, and then some area, some, uh, there'll be some boxes for folks to fill in with simple narrative on what motivated the work, what the goals of the work were, uh, and then what were the outcomes, the results, benefits, both qualitative and quantitative. We'd like to, for the most part, try and have the work broken up into four or five groups. Um, a plan, policies, programs, or projects, and there'll, there'll be a brief description in the best practices form to help people kind of guide them through that process. As I said, the link for the form on best practices will be accessible through the survey that Stephanie had mentioned that's accessible through the AARP and APA websites. We're going to work with global partners um, if needed to translate that um, to uh, make sure if there's some really great best practices but the practitioners are not able to um, follow the survey, excuse me, follow the best practices form, that so we'll want to make sure we work with them to, to be able to capture the, 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 those examples. 
Submissions will be reviewed by the AARP and APA research team, so many of the people who we've heard today on this webinar. And follow-up calls or emails will be conducted to clarify the best practices and make sure we're getting all the right details. In the short term, as Stephanie has said, a number of these will be featured as part of the facilitated conversation at APA's National Planning Conference in New Orleans in 2018. And a number of the best practices will also be highlighted um, in, on both the APA and AARP's website. In the long run, our hope is to make this collection of best practices available and searchable online and also potentially have a way for people to continue adding to it um, so that way there'll be these great examples of, of the great work that people are doing in this realm for uh, all of us to learn from and hopefully inspire us to continue the work. So with that, I'll pass it back to Stephanie for some closing words. Great. Thank you, Michael. So um, I listed here on the next slide uh, the contact information for all the presenters, as well as my partner at the APA, uh, the chair of the International Division, Tim Van Epp. And again, we are not asking you to complete an evaluation survey of the webinar, but we are asking planners to please complete the International Planner Engagement Survey. And also, please share it with your colleagues and with your networks. So with that, I want to thank you, um, thank our International Coalition of Volunteers and Partners uh, who helped to shape and advance this research. Thank all today's presenters, and thank you for your participation. Have a wonderful day.